Folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, download our free app, and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and as I... Uh, Go around the world the last six and a half years trying to um, elicit and uh, and retain enlightenment, wisdom, and love from some of the most melodic impro- improvisers of our musical spectrum. It is an honor to to connect with a cat who uh, who played reggae music. And uh, the thing about uh, reggae music that is so intoxicating, uh, most of the time white cats clap on the one and three instead of the two and four. So their, their time is just off. But in reggae music, the beat is on the one and three. And that in itself was completely intoxicating to so many dudes who were in the States and women for that matter. When they first heard those sounds coming out of Jamaica uh, in the sixties and seventies. And without further ado, looking to drop some knowledge on us, Vince Black, welcome to the Jake Feinberg show. Yes, man, but you still, you still, you still have it wrong. Still on the two and the four, my brother. Tell me what you mean. All right, well, see, in America, the people count one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. In Jamaica, it's one, two, three, four. So, so the drop is on the two and the four. It's a one, two, three, four. So it's on the two and the four. One, two, three. Four. So it is two and four. I dig. So, I mean, can you, I just would love you to talk to the audience, Vince, about in your childhood, how you developed a time feel. This is very important because, uh, you know, we've had the advent of the drum machine. Uh, and at that point in the mid seventies, after that drummers, uh, began to, uh, emulate, uh, uh, a machine as opposed to actual human beings. Uh, as a multi-instrumentalist, I'd like you to talk to the audience about how you developed Time Feel. Well, you know, my brother, right now, I'm going to tell you. They have, they have a saying called, art imitates life, and this, in this case, life imitated art. <laughs> All right? So some people thought they was clever by using this drum machine business. And people got used to the drum machine. So after, after that, you know, people start playing like a like 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 a machine instead of playing like people. You, un, you understand? I dig. It's like, it, it, you know, techn- technology is good in some ways, but in some ways, it it, 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 it can be like a crutch. You, know, you, you understand what I'm trying to say? It, you know, mm. you, you, a machine is just a machine. It just does what it's programmed to do. And but if you keep following a machine, you become a machine. There's no there's no improvisation in it, and if you do have improvisation, it's got a, a, a machine type feel, you know. Well, I guess uh, you know what I want. Wanna... Yeah, no. What I what I wanted to to get at is this idea of saying, I mean, when you when you really look at this thing, it, it, it's it's remarkable to me that if how come human beings. I mean, if a human being can't keep good time, then then what's the point? I mean, why? I don't get it. I mean, what happened to the idea? There were plenty of dudes. There were plenty of drummers. I've interviewed a ton of them, and they had great time. And I don't quite exactly, you know. And, and so, why why do you need a machine? I mean, if you can't keep time, then you just find somebody that can, you know. You know, well, you know what happened was it became because it, it got cheaper for production. Right. To me, to me, in the music business. The music business, the music itself, kind of got to be low budget because it, it got cheaper for people to do productions. You know, when they start this, this computerized business, and somebody they, they do some music, and it, it's not really quite all the way there. But it's the producer, because he's trying to make a quick money, he says that can work. You know, a certain thing, a certain thing go on. You know, the people will say, well, that can work, and, and the music is cheaper and cheaper. And with the digital sound, you know, as a, as, a, as a musician and as a producer and a writer and an engineer myself, you know, the di- between the digital sound and the analog, the digital is more stiff, you know, and the music comes out more two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional. There's not too much depth in the music nowadays. You, 
and there's a frontal assault in the music, but there's the, there's no depth in it. You know, we in the old days, like nowadays, people come, are, are, are content to listen to music on Chinese speakers and say, "Oh yeah, my hey, everything is great." Where before, when you had big stereo speakers, and you could really hear the music. You could hear the depths in the music, and you could do more things inside the music. But, but the creativity is, is, is nowadays is just in creating beats. Everything. I make beats. Yeah, people will make tons of money making beats. Well, you know, I work with people like well, like the late Styles Todd and Santa Davis and people like that, or even the rock bands I've been with. Those drummers, like you said, they're on time. You know, they're just right there on time all the time. One of the greatest Styles Scott who I worked with, the late Styles Scott who I worked with, with Dub Syndicate from, from Roots Radix. Sure. Style was, we, style was like a, a, a clock. You know, because a lot of because the vocals, a lot of things we did with with, with, with for samplers. You never use the click track. You know, you always on time. You know, uh, the drummer that used to play with Steel Pulse, uh, Grizzly. He was like a clock. You know, it was like because his timing was impeccable. Sasha Davis is the same way. You know, so you have a lot of good musicians out there, but as far as recorded music, everybody's listening to this um, to these machines. You know, and it's, and it's it just rolls. You know, if, if you give people bad food and it's all they have to eat, that's where the best the best food in the world. You know, so <laughs> no. So here's the thing. I want, I want I, this is so important, and this is why I, I love talking to cats like you. Explain to the audience, especially younger cats like my daughters and people that have had digital beats crunched into their ears for decades, the difference between two dimensional music and three-dimensional music, and how the three-dimensional allows the music to breathe. Explain what they are missing, wh wh why their ears are locked right now. It's the difference between having a girlfriend and having a wife. <laughs> yeah, break, it, break, it, break it down. Break it down, baby. You, you can have a girlfriend. If somebody who's your friend is a girl. But when you take, when you take away the, the little fun things you do, what's left? Marriage. You have a wife. She's part of you. You're part of her. And when you and, and you can't take away anything. It's a, and it's a whole lot there. The music nowadays they just stack it up. It's almost like um, it's like a, a, a corrupted version of the wall of sound that Phil Spector did. Even though I don't really have too much respect for him as a, as, as a producer, other than just using lots of reverb, you know. But but um. They stack up a bunch of music, and they put it within a certain frequency to capture a full attention. But there's no small things in in, the, in, the, in between. There's no little things, you know. There's no panning. There's no there's, there's no depth in the music, you know. There's no different frequency. Everything is with a certain frequency, and just blasts right in front of you. And like, yeah, we're having a good time. But when you sit down to listen to the music on a, on, on a headphone. They tell you don't turn up too loud to the plaster you ears out because it's just it's just done just but there's no subtleties in it. There's no there's no variance in it. So but you know, the sort of music music sort of music changed. In the twenties they recorded music, they didn't even have proper microphone, they had a big megaphone type thing and they just positioned musicians in a room and people got used to first the first recordings like that. Then in the thirties and forties they got a little bit better. Then by the fifties they started getting stereo the sound got better. So by the 60s, the song was really good, nice and warm and full. Then by the 70s, they were, they were experimenting with, with, with quadraphonic sound. But the music stayed nice and full. But when the digital thing came in, it kind of like went backwards. The music started kind of going backwards. So that, that's the only way I can explain it, you know. No, I, I think you're... I think you're else, yeah, I think you're... I think you're... I mean, I think you're spot on. I, I, I wonder, though, when, you're, when you play live... Um, do you feel one of your obligation, not an obligation, but one of the, the intentions that you have is to try to demonstrate to the audience who might be looking at their iPhones or glazed over or actually truly authentically searching for real music? Do you try to give them a real in, uh, intense, dynamic musical performance? Because that's the other thing. I, I guess I would like you to personalize how you developed inner time feel yourself with with the earliest bands that you were in, and then also uh, dynamic range. I mean, let's face it. I have to. Just a, yeah, go ahead. 
You just you just took the idea. I just I had a show last night in Oakland. And while we were playing, I could see a couple of you sit out there and then look on them phones. And, and then but while the music is playing, then look on them phones. They're not paying attention to the music at all. They just look on them phones. So the attention span of people, these people's attention span nowadays, you know, it's, it's, it's everybody, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> come like everyone has come very insular. You know, it's like what, what, what can excite them or what everything is all about them. I mean, when I was young, we wouldn't go into a bar, go into a club, if it didn't have a band playing. Nowadays, people don't go to clubs or bars to hear a band. They go to see each other, you know, and listen to pre-recorded music. Right. People would rather pay money. People would rather pay money to hear a man spin records than to go hear a band and really, really appreciate the music. People are on the thing nowadays of just what the beat can do, and you don't have to have too much melody. And, and it just makes them jump up and dance, and they can look at each other and go, yay! And that's okay, too, you know. But 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 no one is, that's, that's why you don't hear too many young people really appreciate jazz or blues, you know. But it's the time. It's the time, my brother. You know, it's the time. The time has gotten people. Let me, can you talk about, um, yeah, go ahead. Did they have been gotten bogey in their minds, they got weary in their minds, and it's too much responsibility to, to pay attention, you know, it's too much responsibility nowadays for people, it's too much responsibility for them to think, you know, or to feel. I, I, compl- uh, I mean, also, I mean, we've gotten so uh, wonkish and so a- academic in the playing that people are much more interested in the the propensity of technical chops than the, than the time feel. Can you go back to a time when you were when you really learned on the bandstand, especially in an unamplified setting? I mean, I'm talking to cats like Randy Brecker, trumpet player, who used to go see Miles with a um, what was the thing called here? Let me <clears throat> let me drag up this quote here. Uh, it was called a um. Uh, a uh, Harmon mute on his trumpet. Okay, so he basically. Right. Okay, so like I mean, he he had to hear. He had to. His ears were growing. The music was unamplified. Okay. Did can you talk about a time in your early career, in a setting when you really your ears grew the most because ultimately you had to play softer in order to listen to what the other instruments were doing. You know, when I was young, I, I went I went to hear a concert one time. But a man I really respect and I love his music, a man named Leo Kotke. Oh, yeah. And he played acoustic guitar and he open tuning with slide. I still, I still play, I play a lot of that type of music still. And this is no electricity. He just put a mic up in the microphone up in front of these acoustic guitars and a man would sit there and play his guitar. And, you, and that's how you learn, and that's how you really learn how to play music. You know, you have lots of musicians out here who are, who, are, who, are, who are better than the music they the music that they're famous for? They play better. They're actually better than that, but they can't get an audience to listen to them. You know, it, it just you know. I'm, I'm, I remember there was a time when people had hit records just off the instrumental. You know, when's the last time you had where there been a hit song that was an instrumental? I, I it's think, been a long time since. You, absolutely. You had, oh, whether it was big yeah. bands or whether it was big bands like. Uh, Perez Prado or Hugo Wittenthaler or Ackerbill or uh, even uh, Dennis Coffey or, you know, it's been a long time since it's been a hit record where it was just instrumental where people listen to the instruments play and get off on the music, you know. You're not going to hear that again because people are so busy. They want to hear somebody sing about about sex or their girlfriend or how great they are. But the back, 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 back. Yes, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great. My girlfriend is, and you got our tight jeans. And that's, and that's because that's what people are into, you know. Even the so-called country music. Uh, you can call that country music, yeah. And it's just somebody that's playing pop music with some back bang and the twang and the bar. And they say that's country music, but it's, it's really pop music, my brother, you know. Oh, I dig. There's, there's, no, there's no acoustic guitar basis to it. There's, there's it's, but but you know a sort of go so the times change so people people just go on with what they want you know. 
But what about you? I mean, okay, so you saw Kotke, but I mean, specifically when you got your axe in your hand, can you talk about a band where you guys were playing instrumental music, uh, not necessarily trying to make a hit, but you were able to stretch out and you learned about dynamics and time feel? Yeah, man, but that's what, that's what we were doing all the time. Like, I played with Salsa Band, uh, early fusion. I, I was playing fusion music before it was known as fusion. But then when it got to the point where everybody was trying to be, everybody's playing so fast. Before this, before the shredder, of heavy heavy metal music, and yeah, people like uh, what's that brother's name, uh, Al Demiola and John McLaughlin and people like that. And it just got to the point where they're playing a whole bunch of notes. And I said, well, I'm, I, was, I was glad when the punk rock started. They're like, just break it back down to the basics again, you know? Right. Just just break it break it back down to the basics, you know? Because after a while, people get so technical. They people start thinking about their technique as opposed to the feeling that they're putting to the music. I heard I heard some 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 character said it. He would rather chew glass and let me listen to Jimi Hendrix because this guy can play. This guy can play. He plays heavy metal music. I'm not gonna miss his name because I don't like that he said that. Because he can play a million miles, uh, a million notes. But this cat, nobody knows who he is. They're never gonna, very few people know who he is. He would never be able to play guitar the way he did if he hadn't been for someone like Jimi Hendrix, who came off of a basic foundation of blues music and a basic foundation of music as being as pure as it can be, you know? And the fact that Hendrix had a vision that no one else had, but no one else was demonstrating as far as playing guitar. So now you have all these cats, they have the latest, and you see that Hendrix didn't have the big technical equipment. They have the latest technical equipment, and they practice for hours. They can play uh, five million notes in, inside of 10 seconds, but there's no feeling in it, you know? So technology, like I said, can be a good thing, but at the same time, it can also be a bad thing. Yeah, because people start to learn, like, learn to rely on a technique. It's like, it's like the, you know, it's like being a lover, you know. You know, your technique might be fine, but if there's no love in it. Can you there's, just, there's no can you, no love I, in I, it. I really want to there's talk, nothing. I want to talk to Vince Black, though, about, okay, so before, uh, like you said, what like the Billy Cobham Mahavishnu Orchestra fusion? Can you talk about the fusion music that you were playing, that you believe was fusion music before we started calling it fusion music? Well, the kind of music we were playing back in those days, it was like we all play, we all like psychedelic music, but we like funk music. Sure. You know, we like rock music, but we like soul. You know, we like Latin music and we like jazz. So, when, so how we were feeling this, it all just went into everything that we was do, that we were doing. You know, well, if, if we were, with Jamaican music, you know, it was it was everything was, was blended together. We didn't limit ourselves to one thing within the music. You know, and then later on, this style got to be called got to be called world music. But there's some there's some there was some you listen to stuff like highlights, like African highlights, which incorporates African music and soul and jazz. That's fusion, fusing different types of music all together, but not to try to make a sound. It is the sound. You understand what I'm trying to say, my oh, brother? I, I dig, brother. I did. This is great. Yeah. Oh, he hell yeah. I mean, were you? I mean, can we get a time? What was this? Like late '60s, mid '60s? What? What? Do you, what, what? What time period? Late, late '60s, early '70s. And where? Where? Where, 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 where were you stationed at that time? Where were you at? Well, those times I was going between between Europe. Between, well, I used to live in London, so I was going between London and Chicago and California and Jamaica. Unbelievable. So, I mean, can you talk about um, the <clears throat> what kind of musical groups you had in in England at that time? I mean, that is that place always uh, adhered to. Well, we're play, we're play, we were playing Caribbean music, but we're also playing heavy metal, but we're playing blues rock. We were playing funk, you know. We were all different, kind of, all different kind of sounds because the musical scene was so wide open. It wasn't categorized. It wasn't categorized. It was just music. I mean, I remember there was a time you could go to a Bill Graham show at, at uh, Winterland, mm -hmm. one of those places. Not Winterland, uh, Fillmore. And you would have on the show, you would have Jefferson Airplane, and Taj Mahal, and uh, the, preserva uh, the, pre the, the, pre uh, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Yeah, I dig. I dig. Yeah, you're all a different kind of groups, all on one show. And everybody liked 
every every different kind of group playing every different kind of music. So people's minds was more open to everything. And music had a big explosion there. But nowadays, when you go to a show, they, they don't bring different kind of music together. If it's a reggae show, it's just reggae. If it's a rock show, it's just a rock show. They don't bend, they don't bend all different types of sounds. Even up there, even the only thing you find maybe is like some festivals. If you go to Glastonbury Festival or Bonnaroo or something like that, I played Bonnaroo a few years ago with with, with Black Uhuru, you know, and the way was us was on the show, and then Eminem was on the show, and then uh, Dennis Coffee was on the show, and yeah, all different kind of music like that, you know. But but as as far as like shows and town concerts, you don't have that anymore. They they will put different kind of music. But I lived in England, like in say mid '70s, they had the Rock Against Racism show, right? Sure. So you have a punk band, you have a punk band, you have a reggae band, then you would have like uh, what they call pub bands, you know, like uh, Ian Duria or uh, Brinsley Schwartz and those kind of groups like that, you know. So they had different kind of I mean, people's minds were still open to different kind of music, and especially because it was a Rock Against Racism show, you got all the different type of people there, and everybody. Got off and, you know, I'm going to tell you somebody who I really like is uh, the brother Paul Seminar from, uh, from The Clash. Right on. One of their biggest tunes, uh, London is Calling. People wonder why that song was so big. But if you listen to that tune, Paul, he's hanging around with us at Basin Street Studios in Labro Grove. And he, he was really into reggae. So when you hear the bass line of London is Calling, that's a reggae bass line that he's playing. Not a phony reggae bass line like what, 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 what that group called the police to play. Paul Simon was playing a real reggae bass line <laughs> on top of a, on, on top of, on, on top on, 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 holding down a, a, a punk rock a punk rock top. You know the, the guitar was was punked out, but the bass line was, was strictly reggae, and the song was a hit. And that's fusion to me. That's real fusion, you know, because it, it had to, but, but it was natural. It wasn't contrived. Or anything like that, you know. And I, I, I really respect that brother for that. I really, re- and then of course I respect the class. But they brought Mikey Dread from Jamaica, you know, to a, to America for the first time. I used to work with Mikey Dread as well, you know. You know, I, I wanted to talk to you. I mean, were you? You've you've mentioned psychedelic blues, but do you feel like uh, Cream, for instance? I mean, Cream was doing authentic fusion music, right? I mean, Ginger Baker and those cats. Uh, I'm just trying to. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 because Ginger Baker and Jack Blues, they came out of a, a great man called Alexis Corner. Yeah. They came out of that Alexis Corner uh, 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 camp, you know. And uh, and Eric Cotton was a, was, was a blues purist. And so he worked with them, but then they, when the music, because I said the music was so open, you know, they really blacked up with a whole new thing, you know. That's why, you know, that's why when Jimmy Hendrix went to England, you know, he would, if he had to go to England, we never would have heard about Jimmy Hendrix. Because what he did in England and everything, he was already doing. He didn't pick that up over there. He was already doing it. But it was, it, the area he was in in New York, it wasn't free enough for him. He, but he went over there. The, what I really like about the British musicians, we, people have to give it to them. You know, they have this extra dimension. They picked up on, on, the, on, on, on the black American thing, black American music. But they also had their own thing. But they were open up to, 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 to appreciate, appreciate it. And they, and 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 they have that that that, that, that melodic thing going on. This this would really put them on the top. People don't really realize, you know. They say, oh, what? Like I was reading the other day. They said, what's the Mersey beat? John Lennon said, Mersey beat. He said, that's, that's, he said that's American rock and roll played poorly. You know, <laughs> you know he, said, he said, well, no, that, we're trying to imitate those guys. You won't know. And, they came, yeah. and just like and just like with reggae, reggae came out of something else. And they made something for themselves out of it. You have to really respect them brothers in Jamaica for what they did. They, they made a music. People don't really realize that rap music come out of Jamaica. It come off of toasting. It come off, it come off of dance hall. The early times of the toasting music, that's what they call dance hall now. But the toasting music, they come out, they come out, man, like you, Roy, and Duke Reed sound system and, and things like Dennis Alcapone. All that stuff precluded, pre- precluded rap. And, and, and half the rappers, when they started in New York back in the late 70s, were either Jamaican or their parents, they get born in Jamaican, grew up in the Jamaican area in New York. And they did it with American music as, and, and, and speak as, as, as opposed to doing it with Jamaican music. So all that came up, people don't really realize. They think, oh, Eminem was the king of rap, of, of rap music and blah, blah, blah. But they don't really realize that what little man who I just spoke with Reagan in the River last year, he was named Uroy. You know, people don't know the history. They don't know where the music comes from. But, you know, you can't expect everybody to 
so everything. So we just want everybody to be happy. Well, but, I mean, you also need to go back uh, in all vocabularies of music. You need to be able to go back far enough in the lineage to know where – know how you got to where you are and where you're going if you don't know your history how are you supposed to go anywhere the reality is that exactly. the reality is that i want to get this clear jimmy hendrix was in the states and you said he wasn't a, he, he didn't feel it was a free enough environment so he went to england can you talk about that well he was getting he was getting the, the man was getting down on the music he was he was, he was playing sensational music but there was no place for him to play it you know he had, he had a residency at the Cafe Wall, but you know, there was no place, no, there was no audience for to be to appreciate. You know, the um, American music was going, to, was doing a certain thing, and it was all good, but there was no, there was no audience to appreciate, to appreciate him at that time. When Charles Chandler took him to England, the first thing he did, the first time he played music, you know, everybody said, "Eric Clapton is God." He got up on stage, and Eric Clapton had to. Walked off the stage. He dropped his hand and walked off the stage. He said, "What? You didn't tell me he was this good." <laughs> because Jimmy Hendrix was the re- because Jimmy Hendrix was the real deal. But he was wild. His vision in music was his, he was he was already out there, you know. But the crowd appreciated him because because there's like I said, it, it, Britain, in Britain back in those days, London back in those days, everything was wide open, you know. So, but then you have people. And I'll give you a good example. When you have people like, um, well, I'm not going to name certain people who, who, who get put in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but then you have people like Rocky Erickson who, doesn't, who don't go in, you know, 13th floor elevator, bands like that, and Question Mark and Mysterious, they don't go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And these people were, were, were doing some, so it shows you like the thing of, of kind of got a bit stiff. You know, after the 50s, uh, Early rock, uh, rock explosion. They tried to calm it down, you know. So they brought up Cat Boone and Fabian and Bobby Rydell and 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 and, and this little this little milk toast music, you know. So it wasn't until Beatles said, "Oh, we have to let it go now because we're going to lose all this money." So the so the people who have record companies, that's what they're looking for money. So nowadays, and this and this will be what right back to the beginning. That's the reason why the music business has gone down, because right now, every time I look for a big sensation right now, if you have a record that make a big bunch of noise where a beat people can dance to, and you make a video where the women don't have any clothes on, you know, women are scantily clad, you know, and um, the men are acting like a tough gangster or, or acting like they're uh, some sex star or something like that, and it's, it's a sensation, and, and people say, oh, I'm so <laughs> you know, but but there's but there's but there's, no, there's, 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 there's nothing really substantial in it because if they sell five million today, the gay is the new star. If they sell three million next year, they drop them because it's the so-called record companies that are just into are just into making money and they just into sensation. You know, they just into, but. The, so that, that's all I can say about that. Let me let me ask you about something deeper. Um, is because you're talking about people that are looking to make pop records now. A lot of cats are if they look the part. Like you were talking about country music. I mean, Merle Haggard was when I interviewed Merle. Uh, you know, the dude spent. Uh, he was arrested twelve times. He spent was down in the hole in San Quentin, and he was still making hit records. But the music was completely authentic country music exactly okay nowadays exactly. you're if you nowadays you got somebody who has the looks or the or the or the titties or they're pretty and they got thirty thousand twitter followers but they're not even really a musician so the music that becomes pop music is not actually authentically good music because they're not actually even good musicians and i'd like you to instead of pontificating on modern day i'd like you to talk about with 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 black uru or uh uhuru or any bands the mindset you guys had about saying, listen, we may we're, we may not be on point every night, but we are going to bring an authentic show to the peeps. We are going to show that we are going to leave it all on the stage and burn on the bandstand. Can you talk to younger peeps about how to develop authenticity within the construct of a musical group? It's, it's called staying true to yourself. That's really what it's, it's really what it's about. Staying true to yourself. You know, having a vision of not copying other people, of not copying. 
So when I, when I, when I did one of my first videos, the videographer, he said, well, man, he said, well, I got this club we can get, and we have these girls that can dance on the stage. I said, no, my brother. I said, I don't represent like that. I said, my song's about something that's, that's, that's different than that, you know. So we went out and did a video of homeless people and about and, 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 and corruption and things like that. I said, I want the music to have to say something. If your music isn't saying something lasting, it's, it's in my opinion. It, 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 it don't make no sense to do it, you know. I love you're just there just to just to make money off of it, you know. It's, it's, it's people, people, it's, it's being authentic. These country, the early country music or the blues, the blues, the blues band, they were they were living the blues, so they sang the blues, you know. The the, the country artists, you know, they sang about what was going on for them, you know, and and their and their real a, a real life thing. The rock musician was thinking about the real life thing, even if he was a. I mean, even though like uh, somebody like Johnny Thunders, like, he wasn't the greatest guitar player. He had something going on, but he was a dope addict. But he sang about dope, and that's what made people like it. Not because it was about dope, but he was being for real about it. Well, now don't take this wrong, kid. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't condone. No, I, you know, it's called he was he was talking about it. He was talking about his life, but but, but no, I, I did. But people, but people, people, people are being for real about it. You know, you can make a song about. Oh my girlfriend, this and my girlfriend that. But if you just make a song about your girlfriend, so so girls can like the song, just just fall. Yeah, if your woman break your heart and you write something and it, and it, and it means something, it's not gonna come out and you sing about your girlfriend. It's gonna come out singing about your hurt. And then people can really appreciate that. That's that's why that's what the country music was be. You know, when 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 they when they were like with the Patsy Cline would say crazy. You know, or uh. uh Oh, well, Hank, when I walk in the floor over you, it, 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 that's how they really felt. And that's what made those songs mean something, because it meant something to the people who listen to it. So when you play it, when I play with Black Uhuru or Dennis Brown or people, and we're singing about the struggle down in the ghetto. Because we live in the ghetto. That's where we come from. And stuff. Because we're singing about it for real. You know? Some of us, every night you get some of these people or some of these rappers are thinking about what they, what they go through and about the, how they kill somebody. But we don't want them, we don't want to promote that kind of music. We don't want to think about people killing each other. We want to think about people uplifting them. So well, we can think about our hurts, but we don't want to think about our hurts anybody. Okay, but I want to go, oh, Vince, I want to go back, like you, you said, don't copy people, right? But when you were younger, before you had total confidence and security in your own individual voice, how did you, as a group, work on, I, I'm, I, this, is, this show is not about like critiquing Mo- where we are in the modern paradigm of music. This is about promotion of how real music is made. So how did you ultimately, as a group, work on dealing with authentic... Because everybody has to borrow and steal from their idols, and then ultimately you have to find your own voice. So what I'm getting at is exactly. how, how did you do that? I, I don't really care about what's going on. I don't really listen to pop music. I don't see a lot of... I, I wind up staring at the wall. I want you to talk about how you... Well, my brother, there's nothing wrong with pop music. You have lots of good pop music. The Dreams was pop music, you know. Uh, the Miracles was pop music. And, and you got popular music that's really good. You know, you got popular music that's good. You got popular music that's just there just to make money, you know. Like, you have, you have uh, even though, like, that song uh, by Archie, Sugar, Sugar, it was a good tune. It was a hit. But that was just pop music just to, just to make some money off of a cartoon show that was on television, you know. Right. Uh, well, what, I, what I'm saying is, like, when you're young... And you can express, and you're expressing yourself through your music. You know, that's that. As I'm saying, just being yourself is just expressing yourself through your music. And you listen to this, and you say, "Oh man, this guy sounds good. I can't sound like that guy, but I like where he's coming from." You know, this is when you're young because you know you haven't fully developed. What happens is, a lot of people when they get to a certain point, they stop developing, they stop growing in music, and then that music becomes uh, mechanical, stale. You know, if, if, yeah, if your, music, your music is still when you stop growing. Right. Uh, so, so I'm all saying for if you're a young musician, I always encourage young musicians, you know, learn your instrument. If you can only play three chords on your instrument, play those three chords well. I've seen some punk bands come out and move me just as much. As a, as a jazz group, because they were true to what they were doing, uh, they played those three chords, and they played those three chords how they felt them, and it's the best that they could do. 
you know, being the, being the a virtuoso, I always say it's like this. There's a difference between a guitar player and a guitarist. There's a difference between somebody that plays music and someone that's a musician. You don't have to be the greatest musician to be a musician. But when music is just a, a vehicle to make money with or um, to show... Really saying anything. If your music is an expression of yourself, an extension of yourself, then then you find your way. That's, that's the way I see it, my brother. You know. No, I did. What happened I, in Jamaica? Can you talk? What happened in Jamaica yeah. with reggae music? Yeah. Go ahead. What happened in Jamaica with reggae music? They made something out of nothing. So the people had something to say, and they had the ambition to do something, and they made something out of nothing. Nowadays. They think they're making nothing out of something. Um, can you talk about um, the concept? Of, one thing I like about you guys, like, you know, you, reggae music was an indigenous music. It was, it was developed by people. Um, could you just talk about um, the Vince Black concept of the idea that any note can be the one? Can be the what? Any note... Any note can be the one. Everybody's so hung up on where's the one, where's the one. James Jamerson used to say any note can be the one. Can you break exactly. that? Exactly. Can you break? Can you break down your? Exactly. Yeah. I'm just saying. It's, I was just gonna say it's a word called culture. It depends on your culture. Now, like uh, I used to, I used to play, play some Greek music. And Greek music has some has some has some trippy. Has some trippy timings on it, you know. <laughs> You'll be Greek music will go seven four, then it'll go to six four, then it'll go back to seven four, then it'll go to six four, you know. But it's in their culture, so how they hear it, you know. If you, you look up, it's a song called Star Ritza, S T A R I T S A. Look it up on uh, on uh, YouTube, and this song Star Ritza really demonstrates that the music is going seven four. Then it goes to a then it goes to a, a, a six four, then it goes back to the seven four, and so but that's part of that culture, you know. So culture really has a lot to do with it, you know. The, so the culture that you listen to the music, you know, when you go to Jamaica and you get that island vibe, your personal time slows down. You start you start to slow down. You start to take it easy, you know. In America, we we have a you know, one, two, three, four. That's how people count off, and it's all right. You know, one, two, three, four. But if you're in Jamaica, they go one, two, three, four, because they're coming from a different place, and it's part of their culture. If you go listen, you listen to certain African music, you know, certain African music have, 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 within their culture have a certain thing. I used to live in Denmark, you know. Danish music has a certain kind of feel to it, you know, because it's, it's out, of, out of the Danish culture that 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 mid that mid European, that Scandinavian European culture. So every time you you know, we, it, it, culture really has a lot to do with it, you know. The early American rock and roll was a combination of blue was was mostly blues based and it had some and then the rock with the rockabilly and had the country. So that you had two cultures that mixed together really well in, in music between blues and 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 the and the, and the What's the music I'm looking for? Uh, the bluegrass sound. When they mixed those two together, it was a it was a beautiful match. That's why you that's why you had people like uh, Carl Perkins, uh, uh, um, Gene Vincent, you know, people like that. You know. No, I, I mean you're you're doing because, this. This is fan. I mean, I I would love you to talk if possible about um, any opportunity that you had to either play or be in the to get a chance to see you mentioned African high life music and uh, I've done a couple interviews with Randy Weston and he, he Weston uh, played with Fela Kuti in the early 60s when Fela was playing trumpet in a high life setting but then eventually yeah. Fela, Tony Allen and Baba Ken Okololo, they they created uh, or they helped to form Afro beat and I wanted you to, Afrobeat, yeah. can you talk about your first did you get a chance to hang with Fela did you ever see him play I just I, I saw, I saw, I saw, I, I, I saw, I saw him. I didn't get to hang around with him. But I saw him, but then, but the, the Afro, the Afrobeat was like the highlight 
with the James Brown part put into it. They, they, they started going off at James Brown, the James Brown feel into the highlight, and it became the Afro beat, you know, and which was a good because it was, it was a good thing because it's like two the, 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 because, because really the James Brown music remember is African it all, it all originated in Africa in the first place. You have to realize most of the pop music in the world has its origin or has its origin in Africa. Absolutely. You know, it has its origin in Africa. But then there was a band back in the seventies called the Fanta- uh the Sadistic Mika band. That was from Japan. Wow. And they played funk music but they had a Japanese culture twist to it. And it worked beautifully. Uh uh, look it up on YouTube. It's called uh, uh, Fantastic Mika Band. Look some of the earlier some, some of the earlier releases on YouTube. Uh, Mika, M-I-K-A. The Sadistic, not Fantastic, the Sadistic Mika Band. <laughs> and it was like the Japanese version of funk music. And it was just like fantastic. And it wasn't like trying to copy funk. They were real funksters. But, it, but they couldn't help themselves go to Japanese, so they had the Japanese thing to it. And it, just had, it, just, it was just a great sound. Really, really great sound. So that was like two cultures clashing but not clashing against each other, they're working together, you know? I did. No, I mean, this is really what it's about is, and I love how you're, I mean, listen, can we just, can you talk about an experience, uh, your first experience going back to the motherland? A lot of people get confused and they say the the Greeks and the Romans were the start of civilization. It was actually the Chinese and the Africans. And can you talk about going back to the motherland of Africa and uh, and an experience, because that music is timeless, and it's also very much part of the well. Cult. Well, the, the 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 thing of the, the thing about African music, you know, it, it was it was done was course a long time ago, you know. So there was no electricity in, in the music. It's like with all music, it started with some. It starts with, here. Let me give you before I go to that. When I learned how to play guitar, I didn't learn an electric guitar. I learned an acoustic guitar first. But I write my music. I write it on acoustic acoustic guitar. But I practice. I practice on acoustic guitar. You know, if it doesn't sound good there, it's not gonna really be work. It's not. It's not really gonna sound good anywhere else. Sure. But that's my opinion. But with Africa, it's just the, it's just the roots of the music. It, it, it's just like it's just like if you go to, um, like I said, when I was in Denmark and you hear these old Danish tunes, you know, from like hundreds of years ago. You know. And you listen to the music, because music is music. A, B, A, B, C, D. is A, B, C, D in any language or any place in the world. A tone, a note, 440 is 440 anywhere you go in the world. That's A. 440 A is 440. That's the same no matter where you go in the world. So when you, when you open your mind and tune in to the expression of a people, no matter what part of the world they're from, it could be polka, you know, it could be it could be anything, you know, and you listen to the expression of a people. You know, I've had an opportunity. That's their culture. You know, I, I've had that's a, their culture. Sure, no, no, no. So going to Africa, so going to Africa. I mean, uh, Ginger Baker. We spoke about Ginger Baker earlier. Ginger Baker didn't like Buddy Rich because he said Buddy Rich thinks all Africans play with their play drums with their hands. And you go to Africa, and and, and most of the drums is, 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 is done with drumsticks. Or some other appliance other than just playing, playing, playing drums with the hands, you know. And and, and the percussion. But people, many people don't know that the banjo is, a, is, is an African history. It comes out of out of, out of a Exactly. No, I mean, you know? I mean, I'm on the first universities, the first hospitals, uh, the the banjo. All this stuff was from Africa. Yeah, yeah. It gets lost. But, but, but then again, when you when you live in a, when you live in a, um, let's get into politics now. When you live in a society that only teaches you certain things, then you don't, the people only only think certain things. They, right. You know, people people think they say, "Oh, Greek, Greek, uh, 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 Greece is the uh, beginning of civilization." No, long when long before the Greeks, I mean, like when Germans was was, was still living in mud huts, you know, they had already built palaces in Egypt, Egypt is Africa, and in and in and in Kush. And all in places like that, you know. So, but that's that's a whole other story. I'm getting away from music. You know? No, I mean, I think what, what, going back to what we talked about before, where you got to give the English cats props for, like, really identifying authentic ethnic music. When I interviewed John Mayall, I mean, you know, he just talked. Uh, a king, a king. Well, he but you know, king. what he said was, 
unlike the states, there's no color bar in England. You don't have to, you know, there's no bar, there's no bar, you know, like if you, if you can burn and play, that's who you are. There's no color bar. And, and, and so we can't get over that in this country. And even though it's an amazing country and I, and you know, technology's connected us, you found my excerpts online, you know what I'm doing. So technology is great, but if you can't even acknowledge your original sin, which is slavery, then there's going to be a color bar on everything, and you're never going to really know your history. You dig? Well, well, even even worse than that, the original sin is idol. It's called idolatry. What's that? Because when people worship themselves, idolatry. When people worship themselves, yeah. an idol. When yeah. people worship uh, themselves, yeah. absolutely. They think, and they think, and they think we're the big thing. We're everything comes from us. We, we, me, I. That's idolatry. So when your mind is limited, limited to that, then you can't, then, then you can't get anywhere in the, you know. I mean, you're you're you're, you're limited, you know. You, you're limited, but like it's like like I, like I was saying, I'm mean, like I saw. I remember the first time I saw John. I mean, I always I loved John. I mean, he's a real king in the music, a real king in the music. And 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 but those bridges they were open because they had their little skiffle bands that they did. But when I get anywhere, feeling the they started hearing rock and blues and. I think we might have just been disconnected from Vince Black. Uh, we're going to rejoin the Jim Parisi show in progress. Our baby cribs, covered with bright-colored lead-based paint, right? We had no child-proof lids on any medicine bottles. We had no doors on cabinets or cabinets. And when we... Call dropped. Continue. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I was saying, about you go to Irish, to Ireland, you hear this Irish music, man. This is a, a really rich music, you know. You play some Irish music, and some blues, and some African music. What do you have? Ben Lizzie. You know, like I said, I'm gonna names up my friends like Gary Moore. You know, uh, Keith Richards. All those people like that. They all appreciated blues music. They all appreciated. All different kind of culture of, of music. Keith Richards said he loves reggae. He's, he's been having time in, in Jamaica. You know, he has a place down in Jamaica. Whatever they do, the Wingless, the Wingless uh, Angels album, he takes all the money he makes from that. He gives it to these poor Jamaicans. You know, these poor Jamaican, Jamaican musicians who will never get a break, who will, ne- who will never have a chance to make any money any other way. I respect people like that. You know. Well, no, I mean, I did you have you had a chance? One of the the first cat to actually play. Uh, congas uh, in uh, reggae music, uh, like for for Marley and those cats, was Larry McDonald. Did, did you have you had a chance to to play with Larry? Oh, brother, I've been doing Larry McDonald for almost forty years. Please, Larry McDonald please tell me, to get band together. Please tell me, please tell me, uh, uh, th- tell me everything about Larry McDonald because that dude, I I've done two interviews with Larry and I kind of had this feeling that you guys might have been collaborating. So please break yeah, it down. Right. Man, Larry McDonald, he's eating eat, eat each other's songs. Larry McDonald, almost eight years old, he's still going strong. Larry McDonald played in, in jazz groups and in show groups, you know, for a long time. You know, Larry McDonald, you know, he's, 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 he would be a, he's a, if you talk to him, he's a great historian on, on Jamaican music and everything. He's still well, he's still, he was with Gil Scott here for such a long time. And, and now he's working with uh, Lee Perry all the time now. Can you talk about the groups that you, no, I've, I've done two interviews with Larry. So uh, can you talk about the groups that you were in with Larry? Because that dude was I know he was out on the West Coast when in, in the Bay Bay or he had a he had a band out there. And I'm, I'm just trying to figure out if you guys actually what, what bands you were in together. Yeah, yeah we, we, we worked together with Sachi and the Mystic Lights. The most of the groups that didn't get the work big, you know, Sachi and the Mystic Lights. And, and then he was with uh, not the late Town. It was uh, Rhythm. And some other bands out there back those back in the day, you know. And then he went on to go with um, with Gil Scott Heron for a long time, you know. In fact, that time I was, started working with Soul Syndicate after Chenna was with them, and the, what, was, what was after the Peter Tosh band, and then you know with Black Roo and all those people like that, you know. You Dennis said, Brown, all those people, you know. So you you uh you you say it was the Mystic? What was it? The Mystic Whites? Mystic Lights. Mystic Lights. Yeah, Sati and the Mystic Lights. Wow. A brother, a brother named Sati. That's a, 
It was we that brought reggae to the West Coast back in the 70s, you know. Right. I know Larry. As far as they right. we from Yeah, no, I mean, and, and then. And Larry, yeah, go ahead. And Larry Mack was part of that, you know. Yeah, he's still going strong and he's still kicking butt. Can you, you know, yeah. before we wrap yeah, up, man. before we wrap up set one here, Vince, I, I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about your concept of love, ultimately how you feel you want to bring love to this, to this world uh, in 2017, not just through your music, but through all the stuff we've talked about, impro- improvising, not copying, burning on the bandstand, being able to be flexible, not seeing people be... All right. I'll, Go. As far, as far as on the bandstand, the only way you can really do good on the bandstand is to take your ego out of the music and play to the best of your ability and, and play with your feeling and not with technique. You play with your feeling. Sometimes one or two notes is better than a million notes, you know? You know, you can... You can, you can, you can, you can, you can you can kiss a million girls; it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and you can kiss one, and you can kiss one woman, and it means everything. You know what I mean? As far as love, we uh, as, as far as love, I know from my personal experience, there's only one God, and that God is love, as it tells us in First John four eight, First John four uh, sixteen. If any man that doesn't know love doesn't know God, because God is love. There's only one God, and God is love. And love is more than just, oh, I love you. I love my friend. Love is the perfect order of things, everything being the way it should be, everyone respecting each other. We don't have to, we don't have to respect bad behavior. But when I say respect, we want to do the best towards everyone. There's only one God, and God loves every one of us. In spite of our sins, in spite of our faults, God loves every one of us all the time. That's why he gave us a beautiful world to be in. The only reason why there's poverty in the world and suffering is because of people. People say, oh, where's God? Oh, if there's wars and disease, we bring those things on ourselves. So God gave us the world. He said, this is for you for you to deal with. I'm not going to interfere with you. You know, he said, I said I'm not a dictator. I'm not going to try to make you be good or or, or, or cook. He said, you, you to work this out. God gives us free will. Love, gives, love is free. Love gives us free will. So when you see poverty in the world, it had nothing to do with God. It has to do with some greedy guy or some other guy with some guns trying to tell other people what to do because they're following our arch enemy, Satan the devil. Because the word Satan means adversary, means enemy. So when you're jealous against people, when you're envious against people, when you hate people, you're being a devil. When you're taking advantage of people, when you're doing wrong to people, you're being a devil because you're making yourself an enemy to others. But God wants us to love each other and respect each other. Now, we're not supposed to put respect and put up with bad behavior. You know, people say, oh, oh, you're, ju- you're judging me. There's a scripture that says, teach me good judgment." Because I believe in your precepts, and the precept is love. So now, when somebody's doing wrong, if somebody molests a child, or somebody kills somebody, or somebody's stealing, we can make judgments on that. Now, we not it's not for us to condemn anyone, because we all have faults. We must be re- reminded that we can't point fingers unless somebody's doing something egregious. But love is the only answer and there is no other answer besides love anything else is demonic well let me tell you something that's all i have to say on that you told me yesterday you didn't want to talk about certain things we just talked about we just burned for an hour larry and we'll do it again real soon I, much love to you brother i really i'll get a copy of this out to you later and i'll be transcribing some of these quotes including the one about love and uh i need you to help me get to i want to connect with more cat, reggae cats of the island cats i I've gotten Monty Alexander, Larry McDonald. Uh, I got to uh, Pablo Moses and Ken Booth, and I, I want to keep growing. This is a regional. Yeah, I'll, 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 and I work except for Monty, and uh, I work with all those people like that. I work with all those people, you know, all those, all those people out of Jamaica. People have a inside of every one of us. We have a longing to be happy. 
You know, everyone wants to be happy. The only way we'll find true happiness is to love each other, be kind to each other, you know, but most important, to love God, to love, love. Well, I say my prayers in the morning. I worship God. I'm worshiping love because God is love. I worship God. I worship our Savior who came to show us how to love. How do we show love? By serving each other and doing good towards each other and sacrificing for each other. That's how we love. Anything else is less than. Man, when it's less than, man, I deal with that. All right, my man. We'll be talking soon. It was great, All right, my great to talk to you, man. All right. Peace. Give thanks and blessings to you and your family. And if anybody hears this, God bless you and your family. And I pray for happiness for each and every one of us. Back at you, man. Much love to you, brother. Take care. Have a great day. I, I bless you. Bye-bye. Bless you. Vince Bell, heavy, heavy cat, dropping knowledge about love, philosophy, and wisdom. It's what the Jake Feinberg Show is about. We'll be back with Mrs. Deitch after this. Boundaries of streets. Remember sitting on your dad's lap when he was driving? A lot of us did that. You pretend you were driving? Can't do it. It's against the law now. Remember when kids used to buy cigarettes for their parents? <laughs> Remember that? You'd be like 10 years old. They'd send you down to the neighborhood store. And not only that, though, the people at the neighborhood store would know you by name. Spanking. Now, I didn't spank my kids. But probably both of them got spanked on the butt about three times. You do it once or twice just to let them know if they're way over the line. Well, we got spanked all the time, right? Spanked with the belt, spanked with the Italian moms used to spank people with the wooden spoon. And what did it do? Did it make the kids get all messed up? I don't think so. So you can't use the water. You can't do all these kinds. I mean, I'll tell another totally out of school story, okay? The drinking age was 18 when I was a kid. And I remember being 17, and I got friendly with the guy that owned the local liquor store. He never asked my age, and he thought that if I were there, I must be 18. And I would sit and talk with him. I'd just sit in the store and talk with him for a half hour here and there and stuff like that. 17-year-old kid. It was in the neighborhood. It was like less than a block from my house. So I knew him real, real well. So on my 18th birthday, and I became legal, I, I went in, I said, hey, it's my birthday, now I can legally buy beer or whatever, and he was a little bit concerned. <laughs> he was like, you mean you've been buying beer all this time and you weren't 18? Did he freak out? No. Did the cops throw me in jail? No. Did I drink and drive? No. Did I do it? We all knew each other. We all took care of each other. Back before that, we would just stand in front of the store and when someone older was going in, we'd say, hey, can you buy us a six-pack of beer? There'd be like five teenagers, right? We'd be doing that. And they'd say, sure, and they'd, they'd do it for us. Now, these kids are jealous.